ancient Roman city to the most dangerous racetracks in the world. Enzo Ferrari would make his name synonymous with the fastest cars on earth. He developed a car that had a voice, a presence, a color that said Ferrari. Ironically, the stylish passenger cars that bore his name meant nothing to him. They were merely a means to finance his obsession with racing and winning. He won practically everything. It was just Ferrari, Ferrari, Ferrari. His worldwide image was being created, and at the same time, enormous dramas were going on in his life. A desperately ill son, a shadowy secret life with his longtime mistress, and manslaughter charges that threatened to bury a legend. There's a driver dead, 14 spectators dead. The press are saying Ferrari are killing people. His only ambition was to win the races. That was his number one goal, and he would let nothing stand in his way. Today, this is how we know Ferrari, a $175,000 360 Spider. Surprisingly, expensive sports cars like this one have little to do with the story of the man whose legacy they carry. It was the turn of the 20th century. The invention of the automobile had inspired road racing fever all over Europe and America. Cars hurtled along dirt and gravel roads, covering as much as 145 miles, sometimes at speeds that reached as much as 50 miles an hour. It was this world into which Enzo Ferrari was born on February 18, 1898. His family home was in the Po Valley in northern Italy, a land crisscrossed by hundred-year-old family farms and graceful vineyards, still famous for its Lambrusco wines and balsamic vinegars. Enzo's father, Alfredo Ferrari was a structural metal contractor with his own business. His mother, Adalgisa, was a typical Italian homemaker who doted on both Enzo and his brother Dino, who was two years older. His early family background was very happy, very happy. And um, he respected his father, and I think he adored and admired his elder brother. The Ferrari home and business was on the outskirts of an ancient Roman city called Modena. The Ferraris lived upstairs in a small apartment. Alfredo's workshop was downstairs, where he sometimes employed as many as 20 workers. Alfredo intended for his sons to take over his business one day, but young Enzo wanted none of it. Instead, he toyed with the idea of being a journalist or even an opera singer. Then in 1908, when Enzo was 10 years old, his father, Alfredo, took both his sons to their first automobile race. Enzo Ferrari discovered the world of automobiles and speed. He saw the great Felici Nazzaro, the great 1907 Grand Prix winner for Fiat, driving a Fiat at speed. And he saw Vincenzo Lancia driving a Fiat at speed. And he was absolutely entranced and that, to him, was absolutely the epitome of bravura. That was the life for a proper man. Alfredo Ferrari had other plans for his boys. He sent them to a mechanical engineering trade school to prepare them to take over the family business. His brother Dino accepted his fate. But Enzo, perhaps something of a dreamer, was utterly disinterested in schoolwork of any sort and flunked out. It was, <laughs> was uh, really a boy with was a lot of personality, always dreaming to be a racing driver, and he uh, was always uh, fascinated by risky jobs and risky sports. By the summer of 1914, when Enzo was 16 years old, Italy was quickly being drawn into the First World War. The following year, his brother Dino enlisted in the Italian army. He was sent to the front as an ambulance driver. 
Then in 1916, Enzo's father died suddenly of pneumonia. Without Alfredo, the once prosperous business soon collapsed. Then word came from the front that his brother Dino was dead of typhoid fever. Within months, Enzo Ferrari's once predictable life seemed to be spinning out of control. He drifted from one menial job to another for more than a year. Finally, in 1917, he was drafted into the army. When he appeared for duty, he announced to his superiors that he was a skilled auto mechanic. Unimpressed, they assigned him to shoe the mules. Because he came from ordinary circumstances, uh, he was not taken seriously in the Army. He had no privilege, he had no title, he had no, uh, no family background that would permit him to be anything more than a simple soldier. Enzo soon contracted pleurisy, a disease that was often fatal at the time. He eventually was transferred to a rundown hospice in Bologna, where he was left to die with the other hopeless cases. Somehow, by sheer grit or perhaps dumb luck, he survived. Discharged from the army in 1918, at the age of 20, Ferrari was a broken young man, physically, mentally, and emotionally. The following year, the Great War came to an end, but Italy was in an economic freefall. In the chaos and disillusionment that followed, Benito Mussolini and his black-shirted fascistas took over. Enzo Ferrari seemed disinterested in the politics of his country. His only concern was to regain the strength he lost during his illness and then somehow get on with his life. He soon managed to get a letter of recommendation from the colonel of his regiment. With that in hand, he headed for Turin, the center of the Italian car industry. When Enzo arrived, he immediately applied for work at one of Turin's most prominent companies, Fiat. The automobile manufacturing giant owned by the wealthy Agnelli family. Ferrari proudly presented his letter. But to the Fiat engineer who spoke with him, the letter meant nothing. Ferrari was told that the city was awash in unemployed war veterans. There was no work. He wrote in his own autobiography how he sat on the park bench in Turin, um, unemployed, lost, his family had gone, his father dead, his older brother dead, no job, no hope, absolutely in despair. And he just sat on the park bench and cried. Enzo Ferrari was not a man who suffered rejection easily. His grief and shame over Fiat's refusal to hire him slowly turned to rage. Far-fetched as it seems, Ferrari swore a vendetta against Fiat and the Agnellis. Somehow, he would find a way to make them pay. At the end of the Great War, Enzo Ferrari surfaced in Turin, Italy, ready to transform himself from a simple country boy into a race car driver and maybe even a star. He had survived a life-threatening illness and had suffered rejection from the leading car manufacturer in the region. He simply refused to give up. Ferrari was a war lover. He loved the competition. He loved the battle. He loved the day-to-day -day struggle. I admire him in many ways because he always answered the bell. He always was ready for the fight. The battleground Ferrari had chosen was the world of fast cars. Up to now, the automobiles used for racing were simply modified passenger cars. The new technology used to power airplanes, tanks and trucks during the war was being tested on specially engineered race cars. And it was all happening in Turin. There was um, a well-known restaurant in the center of Turin that was frequented by the local motor trade and by the local motor industry. And he got to know more and more people and he became very friendly indeed with a slightly older test driver and engineer called Ugo Sivocci. 
Zavacci managed to get Enzo a job at one of the small Italian automakers, CMN, that was located in Milan, some 100 miles east of Turin. It was here that Ferrari bought his first car, a used Alfa Romeo, that he could race. So, at that period was a crazy decision, but he was so in love with uh, racing cars that uh, it, it did really tough decision, decision of his life maybe. This was the starting point of all his career. After seeing both Savacci and Ferrari drive in several local races, Alfa's team manager gave them a chance to drive race cars for Alfa Romeo's team. He did race fairly actively from about 1920 to 24, but they were mostly minor races in Italy, hill climbs and, and rallies and some, some small events. But he was never uh, able to attain the kind of uh, stature that he wanted, I'm sure dreamed of. Ferrari needed to find other ways to increase his income and his prestige. He convinced Alfa Romeo to use him as a sales agent trading and selling their cars to private customers and delivering them personally. It was during this time that he met Laura Domenica Garello, a mysterious 21-year-old woman who haunted the cafes and trattorias frequented by the Turin racing crowd. She became a kind of grey eminence within the Ferrari story. Some say that she was from um, quite a wealthy Torinese family and some say quite the opposite. Um, you know, that she was a professional lady working, w working the streets in Turin. Laura's life before Enzo Ferrari is a mystery. It is known that she and Ferrari traveled the racing circuit as a couple and may have even lived together for several years. In 1923, they married in a small Catholic ceremony. Within months of his marriage, Enzo returned to living the high life, running around with the race car groupies of the day. According to his old friends, Ferrari was an incorrigible ladies' man. If he is a man, why shouldn't he like a woman, especially if she is beautiful? Excuse me, but I'm embarrassed by these questions. Of course he liked a woman, and the more beautiful they were, the more he liked them. Enzo and his wife Laura did battle from the start. Their lives were further complicated when Enzo's mother, Adalgisa, came to live with them. Adalgisa and Laura despised each other. The two women fought openly, with Enzo often in the middle, playing the referee. I saw Mrs. Ferrari once, a little a short lady, you know, quite well built. The only thing I can tell you that I knew that when she used to call her son Enzo Enzo, she was the only woman he would get up and run for. Enzo escaped his troubled home life by throwing himself into work. Alfa Romeo planned to debut a race car called the P1 at the European Grand Prix in Monza. Enzo managed to convince Luigi Bazzi, one of the best engine technicians on the racing circuit, to leave Fiat and come to work with him on the car. Ferrari, Ugo Sivacci, Luigi Bazzi, and the Alfa racing team arrived just one day early for the European Grand Prix at Monza. It was a fast practice run. Sivacci was behind the wheel. He maneuvered the P1 around a sharp curve. It spun out. Savacci was killed. Ferrari was shaken by the death of his friend, the man who had helped him to gain entrance into the world of motorsports. And he knew that the P1 had somehow failed and it needed to be re-engineered. At Bazzi's suggestion, Ferrari recruited another Fiat worker to join him at Alfa Romeo, Vittorio Iano an engineer reputed to be a mechanical genius. Together, Yano, Bazzi, and Ferrari went to work to redesign the P1. 
Remember that Ferrari was not an engineer. He was not a car designer. He was not even particularly mechanically inclined. Within months, under relentless pressure from Ferrari, Jano and Bozzi re-engineered the Alfa Romeo P1 into what they called the P2. At a competition in Cremona, and with star driver Antonio Ascari behind the wheel, the P2 clocked 121 miles per hour, set a lap record, and won the race. Ferrari's victory was the start of a winning streak that pushed Fiat and the Agnellis out of auto racing for good. Enzo Ferrari, a country boy from the Po Valley, had made good on his vendetta against one of the most prosperous companies in Italy, at least for the time being. But winning was only the first step. Now Ferrari had to find a way to finance it. With the help of some rich investors, he offered to strike a deal with Alfa Romeo to take over their car racing business. I will provide the drivers, you just provide the cars. You provide me with any background technical assistance that you can. Come on boys, we'll continue racing, this will be great. And they did, and it was. On December 1st, 1929, he opened the doors on what he called the Scuderia Ferrari. In English, the Ferrari Stable, a stable of the best racing drivers and Alfa Romeo cars that would be re-engineered to Enzo Ferrari's specifications. But at home, his family life continued to disintegrate. In 1932, ten years into their marriage, Laura gave birth to a son. They named him Dino. According to Ferrari's memoirs, Dino was diagnosed with muscular dystrophy, an illness that would slowly destroy his central nervous system. The fact that Dino was ill almost from childhood, that he wasn't a strong boy, must have been terribly difficult for Mr. Ferrari. By 1939, there was world war in Europe. Mussolini had Italy in a stranglehold. A new Alfa Romeo executive severed the relationship with Enzo Ferrari's Scuderia. In order to survive, Ferrari would collaborate with the Italian fascist party. It was 1940, and World War II was spreading its destruction all across Europe. The Italian economy was floundering. Auto racing was suspended indefinitely. The Scuderia Ferrari factory sat idle. To survive financially, Enzo transformed the old Scuderia Ferrari into a factory that produced equipment for the fascist Italian government's war effort. There are conflicting stories about what he manufactured. Some say it was power grinding machines for ball bearings that may have been used in the production of war material. Others insist he made components for a line of machine guns used by the Italian army. He went with the tide, self-evidently, as so many did. I don't think that he was particularly ever signed up to the party. I think he was wed to only one political cause, and that was what was good for Ferrari. In order to protect his factory from Allied bombers, the government ordered Ferrari to move it from Modena to safer grounds. He chose Marinello, a town 10 miles away. On a return trip to Modena, Enzo met Lina Lardi. She was a secretary of this company, and uh, my father met my mother in that uh, in that company, and uh, so started all the story. <laughs> At that time, she was young. My father was more or less 10 years older, and was a man already known in, in town in Modena, and uh, she she didn't like him because uh, he, he was a, a man who was always uh, uh, driving with uh, nice cars. This was a, a relationship that very much affected his life. 
by all accounts, she is a very, very lovely lady, a very serene, quiet uh, woman that uh, brought a lot of peace and, and solitude to his life away from a very contentious situation in his own household. At 46, Enzo Ferrari fell in love with Lena Lardi. Early the next year, Enzo received the news that Lena was pregnant. She delivered a healthy baby boy nine months later and named him Piero. Mother and son were sequestered in Lena's small hometown of Castle Vetro, near Ferrari's Marinello factory. While in Modena, Laura and Enzo celebrated their son Dino's 13th birthday. The boy's health continued to deteriorate. Ferrari fought very hard uh, in the later stages of Dino's uh, illness too. He, he changed his diet and he brought other, other medical uh, consultants in. He sent me out of the country to buy medicine for poor Dino. When I was at the border, I seemed as if I was a um, smuggler of medicine. I had so much, and customs had a problem with letting me pass. When I told them that it was for Ferrari's son, they let me through. But they had wanted to confiscate everything. After the war ended, the Marshall Plan began to infuse millions of Yankee dollars into the suffering Italian economy. The weary Italian public was ready for automobile racing to resume. So was Enzo Ferrari. He began developing new race cars. And in 1947, Ferrari produced a V12 1.5 liter racer called the Tipo 125. By Italian standards, the engine was enormous. He loved engines, and as far as he was concerned, the engine was the be-all and end-all of the racing car or the road car. The chassis was just a, a necessary bracket to hold the wheels on and to put a hole in where the man went. On May 11, 1947, the Tipo 125, the first automobile to carry the name Ferrari, competed at Piacenza, a smaller, less important competition. Enzo chose this race because he wanted to see what his car could do. Spectators lined the streets to get a look at Ferrari's new machine. The Italian sporting press was on hand. Even a few curious members of the Alfa Romeo design staff were there. Incredibly, Enzo Ferrari failed to appear. In fact, from that day forward, he would never attend an auto race in which a Ferrari competed. I don't think he liked all the fuss. You know, when he got there, all the, the journalists and this, and uh, he liked to, to stay quiet. He said that he didn't attend the events because he didn't think his nerves would stand it. Whether that was true or not, don't know. Really don't know. But it was a remarkable move because effectively it added to the public image, to the public aura, to the charisma. You know, the spider sitting in the center of the web. During that first race at Piacenza, with only three laps to go and the Tipo 125 Ferrari in the lead, the fuel pump broke and the car coasted to a stop far short of the finish line. Enzo took the loss in stride. He called his car a promising failure. Although he didn't know it then, the Tipo 125 marked the birth of the mythic Ferrari car culture and empire. Enzo began assembling some of Europe's most brilliant technicians and most celebrated drivers. He would develop some of the fastest racing cars the world had ever seen. His stable of race car drivers would drive these automobiles in competition after competition and win again and again. He won practically everything. The only thing he didn't win was Le Mans in the 50s. The rest of it was just Ferrari, Ferrari, Ferrari. 
competing on the international racing circuit cost as much as a million dollars a year. Ferrari had to find a way to increase his cash flow. In the late 1940s, a former Ferrari race driver named Luigi Canetti convinced Ferrari to give him the exclusive rights to sell a line of expensive Ferrari road cars in America. They would be equipped with engines and chassis adapted for public road use. Ironically, Ferrari had no interest in the road cars at all. They were simply a means to finance his car racing business. Ferrari would probably uh, have, have been perfectly satisfied to build his Grand Prix cars and try to make a living doing that. Outside of the business, Ferrari maintained two households, some 20 miles apart. Some nights he had supper with Laura and Dino at the family home in Modena. Other nights he spent with Lena and Piero in Castle Vetro. He spent a great deal of time with Lena and apparently uh, doted on the boy. And uh, the, uh, the double life seemed to work for him for a long period of time. It didn't seem to complicate his business life much at all. Ten years passed as Ferrari lived this double life. Then on June 30th, 1956, when Dino Ferrari was 24 years old, he died at home in Modena. Ferrari tried to control his emotions. For the rest of his life, he visited Dino's grave every morning before work. Enzo honored the memory of his son with the Dino Ferrari, a car the young man helped to design. From that day on, all of the V6 and some eight-cylinder Ferraris would bear the name Dino. The Dino has so many tragic aspects to it that make it special. As you think of Dino, you think of a baby, a son, and uh, the Dino could be a Ferrari that uh, never got a chance to grow up, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and yet had this uh, bloodline that was unique. It is also believed that it was during this time that Ferrari's wife, Laura, whose only child was now dead, discovered Enzo's secret life with his mistress and their 11-year-old son. It must have been fairly difficult for the old man. It must have been awful for Laura herself because essentially you know she'd lost control she was always a fiery lady so the stories go and the fire the flame and the fury burnt longer and louder and hotter and higher if Laura's discovery had an impact on her husband Enzo no one knew nothing about his behavior betrayed Ferrari's true feelings you could never make head or tail, whether he was sad, whether he was happy, whether he really he suffered or not, because you could never tell, he would never say anything. Within a year of Dino's death, the racing business that Ferrari loved so passionately would slowly begin to unravel. There would be deadly accidents on the track. He would be charged with manslaughter, charges that threatened to bury a legend. The death of Enzo Ferrari's son sent him into an emotional tailspin. He immersed himself in his work, at his office and in his factory, with one singular purpose, to build even faster cars. The year was 1957. The race was the Millimilia, a wildly popular and horribly dangerous 1,000-mile open road event. Five Ferrari automobiles were among the 293 entries. He pulled together a superstar team, including Fon Portago, who was called in as a last-minute replacement. Count Alfonso de Portago was a passionate Spaniard, nobleman, a classic Ferrari driver who drove for the pure love of the sport. Ten million spectators lined the route 
that ran through hairpin turns and narrow village streets. Thousands of police and army regulars would not be enough to keep them out of harm's way. The fevered environment for this event was completely insane. And the Italians loved it. Portago told a friend he didn't want to drive in the Mille Miglia, that he felt it was too dangerous, that no driver could hope to know every turn, every possible road condition. But at 5.31 in the morning, when it was his turn to take off, Portago joined the treacherous 1,000-mile battle, driving the most powerful car in Ferrari's stable, the 4.1-liter Tipo 335. Observers report that Portago's Ferrari was rocketing at full throttle when he suddenly lost control of the car. It spun end over end into a ditch, then over the first row of spectators and into a pole. The impact sent shreds of steel screaming into bystanders. Five children, Portago and his navigator, and 10 other adults were dead. Dozens were injured. The headlines shouted at the public from the front pages of the Italian press, demanding an end to the Mille Miglia. Ferrari was charged with manslaughter for allegedly using tires that were not capable of sustaining those speeds, which was nonsense because the other four Ferrari cars that were in the race and had won, Piero Truffi had won the race, were on the same tires. But the manslaughter trial went on for a number of years and probably affected Ferrari financially and certainly affected his reputation. It took four years of court appearances and appeals for the manslaughter charge to be dropped only to be followed by another calamity on the track in 1961, during the Italian Grand Prix. They had Phil Hill and Taffy von Trips head to head for the Formula One World Championship in the Italian Grand Prix at Monza. And at the end of the second lap, Taffy von Trips, very, very popular, lovely German driver, collided with another car. And his car was thrown into the crowd and it killed 14 spectators. And flopped back onto the road and Taffy was thrown out into the track with his neck broken. And he died as well. So there's a driver dead, 14 spectators dead, and immediately the press are saying, it's happened again. Ferrari are killing people. Enzo Ferrari was 63 years old. There was a growing press corps to contend with. There was the expense of defending himself in another drawn out court case and there was the relentless spiraling cost of developing race cars. With all of this, Ferraris were still winning on the track. But even that was about to change. It was the Ford Motor Company, which after being turned down in a generous bid to buy Ferrari's company, decided to beat him on the racetrack. By 1964, at the European Grand Prix in Monza, the Ford team was closing in. We had six Daytona coupes all lined up for Monza, which uh, we were clearly so superior to the GTOs that what the old rascal did was got the race canceled. We were one or two points behind for that year. 65's when we officially beat the heck out of him. He didn't like that but I, wouldn't, I didn't like it when he beat me either. Ferraris began to lose races, and it was costing him well over a million dollars a year to finance his racing business. Even though Luigi Canetti had made Ferrari passenger cars a legend in America, and the cars were selling for as much as $15,000 a piece, by 1967, Ferrari's company was teetering on the edge of bankruptcy. He'd had to cut back the racing program, his beloved racing program, which is really what he existed for. And effectively, it was at that point that he went cap in hand to Fiat. With no other resources at his disposal, Ferrari had only one choice, to approach his old rivals, the Agnelli family, for financial assistance. 
the Agnellis reportedly paid $11 million for Ferrari's company. They allowed Ferrari to stay in charge of the racing arm of the company, while Fiat took over the manufacturer of road cars. They would be built on a production line. It marked the end of the custom handmade Ferrari road cars that had graced highways all over the world. The deal was officially announced to the Italian public on June 21st, 1969. It was the end of an era for Enzo Ferrari. At long last, he was free to focus his attention solely on winning races. But Enzo Ferrari had unfinished business with his mistress and her growing family. In 1969, Enzo Ferrari was 71 years old and still actively in charge of the Ferrari racing program. His mother, Adalgisa, had died. His only son, Piero, was now in his mid-twenties and married. He came to work at the Scuderia Ferrari to learn his father's business. It was more than Ferrari's aging wife could tolerate. Many of those people have told me of days when Laura would arrive at the door and burst into the office saying, where is he? Where is the little bastard? You know, where is he? Uh, I know that he's here. And Piero would have to go and hide or would have to beat a hasty retreat. Now, that must have just been dreadful for Piero. By then, Enzo Ferrari was beginning to enjoy his new young family. Piero and his wife, Floriana, had an infant daughter, Antonella. Enzo Ferrari's only grandchild. Ferrari became a doting grandfather. For me it was a very old ma a man with uh, uh, white hair and uh, he was very tall and um, he was um, very uh, tough and uh, um, and strong for me and um, but uh, very kind with me. Then, nine years later, in 1978, when Enzo was 80, Laura Ferrari died. They had been married for 55 years. Enzo soon brought his devoted mistress, Lina, to live with him in his house in Modena. Piero and his family followed. In his final years, Ferrari began to enjoy what most would consider a normal family life. Even at the age of 80, Enzo Ferrari refused to retire. His son Piero was made general manager of the Ferrari racing team in the mid-80s. During losing streaks, the two Ferraris often fought over new engineering strategies. I disagreed with my father about the choice of some uh, designers, of some uh, uh, engineers, and so but 99% um, he was winning. I'm a person who likes to, to deal and not to fight. And so I, I'm very different from my father. My father was black and white, yes or no. Ferrari spent time recounting the glory days of racing with his old cronies. Saturday lunches with the boys became a ritual for 80-year-old Enzo Ferrari, especially with Sergio Scaglietti who was an old Ferrari coachmaker from Modena. We would talk about everything, never about work, never, you understand? We tell jokes, discuss who did what, who said what. In the last year of his life, Ferrari was plagued with painful kidney problems. When the Pope made the trip to Maranello to pay his respects, an extraordinary event Ferrari was too ill to meet him in person. By July of 1988, Enzo Ferrari was slowly slipping away. He remained bedridden in his home in Modena, attended by Piero and Floriana. On August 14, 1988, Enzo Ferrari died quietly in his bed with his family surrounding him.
He was 90 years old. A public statement regarding his death was issued at one in the afternoon, seven hours after the funeral, as it was desired by my husband, who was honoring his father's wishes. And at the funeral, we were only six in two cars, and that's it. Ferrari's body was laid to rest in a crypt inside his family tomb, next to his father, Alfredo. Enzo Ferrari's life story is the story of automobile racing, at least for the 20th century. From his humble beginnings in the Po Valley to the empire he built, Enzo Ferrari will be remembered as the last great titan of an industry he helped to create. Under his 40-year leadership from 1947 to 1988, Ferrari automobiles won more than 5,000 races all over the world. Twelve years after Enzo's death, star driver Michael Schumacher clinched his fourth world championship in a Ferrari. Today, the passenger cars that Ferrari disdained sell for as much as a half a million dollars each. Maybe we remember my father because I was a person who was being so strong in his job and he always did in his life uh, one thing, make something new every year, make a new car and uh, a new challenge. He's probably going to go down in history as the man. His influence on the whole of motor racing is maybe the strongest of anyone individual. He was the dominant force in Grand Prix racing and helped lay the groundwork for the multi-billion dollar situation that it is today. I wish I'd known him better. Maybe, maybe nobody ever knew Ferrari. That's very possible that nobody ever knew what he really was inside. <laughs>